Wow, what a nice introduction. It scares me, actually. <laughs> anyway, it's my great pleasure to be here. It's been a few years since I've been here and had the opportunity to be with you. When I was leaving, I told my wife, I love to go to Singapore because I always learn so much from everybody. And that so much is the description of what this conference is all about, is not just hearing data, but learning from each other. So I always like to start off my meetings with having you all stand up, turn around, introduce yourself to somebody new, and tell them why you're here. Could you do that for me now? Stand up, do it. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's exactly, well, you met, did you all meet somebody new? Yeah. Well, inside of this room, my sense is that there's a huge amount of knowledge. And while the speakers here today will be sharing what they know about technology or their approaches or their methodology or organizations, inside this body, inside this room, is collectively some of the greatest knowledge about the application of geography and the future of, in your case, your country in the world. So I want you to invite you to keep doing this again and again all during these couple of days. Here's the slide that I think underpins what I'm trying to get across. You and your work have never been so important. And we'll touch on why during this morning's conversation. The kinds of changes that are going on on the planet right now are unprecedented. And Singapore stands out in my mind as the leading city in the world confronting these challenges, making things more efficient, dealing with the issues of climate change, of population density, of transportation, dealing with social harmony and the ability to get along and understand. This is an amazing experience for me. Again, I'll just underpin it. You and your work are providing a kind of foundation infrastructure for the creation of the future, creating what's next for Singapore. And Thomas emphasized this in his opening remarks. You rest on the shoulders of a whole generation of people who had in their brains the idea of making a smarter city, a smarter approach. And whether it was in technology or social reform or looking at issues of equality or democracy, they laid it down. So today we're going to explore what's next. What's next for your smart city and what can we collectively do to make it better? I'll start this morning's conversation with a little bit of profiling of your work. And some of it will be your work specifically, and some of it will be your work collectively as a global community. Here in Singapore, we see extremely interesting applications of GIS in 3D visualization, but not just visualization, also in analytics. For example, picking out the best place for solar or wind modeling, or doing, do, doing, doing connection between government agencies and citizens. We also see the applications of real time. Real time, for example, supporting the National Day Parade, or real time looking at the environmental challenges of haze here, both in the community, but also beyond regionally. Some of your work is pushing the envelope in green cities. The National Parks Organization here looking at habitats and managing parks, digitizing almost every tree. We also see applications of K through 12. These 60 students, these 60 schools here creating the next generation of geographically literate kids are just the beginning. And we're seeing GIS move into into consumer level technologies, things like navigation here at the university. Beyond Singapore, across the world, GIS is having a huge impact on 
managing land information systems, not just the parcel cadastre, but also the interpretation of that land use planning, showing valuation, showing property valuation as a surface, being able to support 3D cadastre and 3D appraisals. In urban planning, not only here in Singapore, but in Abu Dhabi, building whole new towns, or in Korea, just north of you here, doing urban redevelopment, and just beautiful, not only visualizations, but also good footprints about creating more livable cities. And GIS is moving into buildings, into campuses, being able to visualize them, but also optimize things like space planning or logistics, or just being able to see what buildings are all about, monitoring their IoT or their, their, their sensors with respect to better bu building management. In transportation, whether it's railroads or airports or roadways, we can see, or shipping, we can see advances being made. I'll call your attention here to the, the map showing bicycle sharing in Manhattan in New York City. And by the way, this is an opportunity for me to be, to be pretty excited. Yesterday, New York City decided to, decided to award ESRI their 3D GIS cadaster for the entire city. It's a, well, maybe it doesn't mean much to you, but it means a lot to me. <laughs> so here you go. Um, in some ways, they're copying the vision and the thoughts about next generation 3D that you have pioneered here with things like your advanced 3D mapping platform. GIS has also moved into the engineering space, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. But engineers around the world, architects, public works organizations are using it as a platform for doing field work, for doing engineering design. And I wanted to particularly call your attention here to the red map in the center. It has huge application in Singapore. Actually, that's a joke. Um, this is in South Dakota, where it's very cold in the winter. The freezing causes sidewalks to heave, move up and down. So anyway, I guess you don't get the joke, but uh, <laughs> it, it's an interesting application. In the utility space, GIS has moved beyond simply managing the assets to being able to do analytics, like where and when are power consumption thresholds being reached. And dashboards, as you'll see here and throughout the morning, are the new style of GIS, looking at real-time maps and real-time charts to understand what's going on. The city, of, the city of Topeka, Kansas, has 300 dashboards wired up they're looking at virtually everything with respect to performance or real-time operations that are going on. And here in the lower right, I want you to notice augmented reality. The engineers there are taking out iPads into the field and seeing the pipes and the wires underground, dial toning in the GIS underground to understand their communities. Clearly, in the field of public safety, GIS is contributing to making cities safer, showing patterns of crime, and also, for example, your National Day ex event. Similarly, in the United States, we have something called the Super Bowl, a huge ba basketball, uh, sorry, no, not basketball, not, not soccer, football, that's what it is, <laughs> Super Bowl. It's also supposed to be a joke, but you don't get it. It shows you how illiterate I am in sports. But this national event has uh, about a million people that come to it or around it, and so national security is a big issue there. GIS is helping provide the answers. Our world is changing rapidly, as we know, and this is confronting with things like climate change, more fires. We notice that there are new tools to be able to address these sorts of challenges, uh, and GIS is is using is being used not only to prepare for but also address these challenges increasingly in real time. Finally, a big trend that's occurring in our community is more open 
open connections, with open data through portals, more citizen engagement, back and forth interactions and crowdsourcing through maps, and finally, organizational portals inside of organizations to let people understand the work that they're doing, the kinds of maps and services that they're creating so that they can exchange and collaborate in a new way. Well, this is just a few, a few, these are just a few of the examples of work going on. And your work, uh, I'm told, yesterday I listened to a briefing of so much of it, is just amazing because it reflects exactly these examples. And we can learn from each other. Again, I urge that you share and document your work as you go along because it is through your friends and this exact network that we really learn and grow as a community. The vision I want to talk about is what's next and also inspiring what's next. And for most of you, you'll think, okay, he's going to talk about what's next with a technology or what's next in its application. And that's certainly so. I'm going to do that. But as I do that, I want you to pause for a moment and think about what's next for our planet. And what does that mean for, for your organization? What's next for our planet considering the direction that the arrows are going? And what does that mean for your, your own personal career and your family and for you as an individual? We live today in a complex and interconnected world. Those of you with geography backgrounds understand this very clearly. Things are interconnected. Geography, the science of our world, helps us understand and model and predict, describe, and even organize both the human side of our world and our natural world. Intellectually, it brings it together. And we also know that our world is constantly changing, driven by a number of parameters like population growth or technology achievement. You and I can notice, and, and certainly Singapore is an example of this, that the pace of change is accelerating. When I come here, I notice it. I mean, you living here probably don't notice the sort of incremental change. And this change, here I'm not talking about just Singapore, this change globally is creating many challenges. It's threatening our natural world. And some are beginning to say threatening even our future as human beings. And the evidence is very clear. The maps, the models, the predictions of what's happening with with everything from water to food to loss of biodiversity to overpopulation. These are the kinds of challenges, ladies and gentlemen, that you particularly are focused on. From my perspective, we're now, I mean, I'm an old man, all right? But I've been watching this for a long time. From my perspective, we're now at a place that humans have never been. And that's a sobering thought that we're moving into a space, not by choice, but maybe you might say by choice, where humans have never explored before. And my personal philosophy is that this is going to require much, much more understanding. It's going to require understanding and collaboration and ultimately action by our institutions, in our policy, in the way we live our lives, and all of these things. We're going to have to use our best science, our best people, our best technology to be able to address these challenges. So the question that I ask is, what should we do? And I suppose many of you have asked that question. What can I do as an individual? And certainly you might say, as an individual, maybe I can't do that much. I can do something. And by the way, many people around the world that I visit with are asking those questions. What can we do? And there's many good solutions that are emerging. 
But for us in this room, for us uniquely in this room, we can begin to apply with force the power of digital geography, your career, and envision what's possible, improve things. And this is in the culture of Singapore, isn't it? What more natural place for this to emerge as a powerful force, engaging citizens, protecting biodiversity, as we'll hear later this morning, thinking about how to design with nature, making things, making things smarter, as Thomas said. And from my perspective, this requires all of us to keep moving and learning. It's no time to settle back or take our paddle out of the canoe. No, we, we have to accelerate as professionals, you and I, what we're doing, applying our best science and holistic design thinking to take on these challenges. Now this, this field, your field, the science of where, provides us a framework to apply geographic knowledge. It's both a framework and a process to create geographic knowledge and apply it, starting with measurements and communication vehicles like maps and then analytic models using the best models and AI and machine learning to be able to predict and then, and then make, make these predictions and this understanding integrated right into the way that we design and plan. And again, uh, my heart is lifted when I come to Singapore and listen to you talk about your thoughts about creating planning processes and design processes with it, which integrate science into not only thinking about the future, but also acting it out. This science of where provides us with a foundation, certainly for GIS, the practice that many of you do. And it's now expanding into GIS with simpler tools for simple mapping and, and, a, and a simpler technology pattern of, of location analytics. It's now also emerging to be components of other information systems, geo-enabling, bringing our science into other independent systems. They're not necessarily GIS, but they, they make geography and GIS come alive in other IT and workflow systems. Like the rest of the world, technology is fueling the growth and advancement of our field. And I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that, integrating more data, bigger data, better data, computing and innovation, creating new patterns of GIS. It's not mainframe GIS anymore. It's not workstation or PC or, or even servers. It's a new pattern which is much easier, web GIS. This is expanding the power of GIS with more data, new data types, crowdsourcing, new kinds of imagery, LIDAR, new measurement. It's also advancing with new forms of computing, not only faster machines, but also new integration with, with tools like AI or, or IoT, real time, new forms of architecture, distributed computing. And it's also being fueled by new innovations in our field, better visualization and modeling tools, smart mapping, AI connections and integration, and many others. The outcome of these trends, these forces, has resulted in a whole new pattern, this WebGIS pattern. And that WebGIS pattern is a new architecture. How many of you feel like you know this architecture quite well? Really? Two people? Are you sure? <laughs> Let me ask the question again. How many of you feel like you understand the WebGIS pattern? Okay, that's better. 
Now, let's do it one more time. <laughs> Is it really only 17% that really understand the concept of a web GIS as opposed to desktop GIS? How many of you understand it conceptually? Okay, that's 46%. That's better. So that gives me a purpose in my talk. Let's first recognize that the WebGIS is a new architecture. It's not client server. It's not desktop architecture. It's a new architecture that's built on services. So my data I can serve out as a web service, like a dial tone, and you can consume my web service. That's one of the basic concepts. So in addition to open data, I'm open servicing the web. And you don't have to share all of your data, but you can share the data that you want to share with who you want to share it to. So I can share in a collective environment, kind of like a database can, putting it all into a database, but I put it into a services framework and other people can discover services, integrate them, mash them up, leverage them in various applications. So this sharing and collaboration concept is essential to understanding the architecture. And my content can be on a distributed network of machines, some over there, some over there, some over there, some in, in this agency, some in that agency, and it can live there. I don't have to copy it anymore. I can just read it dynamically and integrate it and mash it up for my application. That's different than what we dealt with in the 80s or the 90s or the first part of the century. It's actually the fabric that allows us to collaborate. That's why friendship is so important. I want to share with you my content in such a way that it allows you to leverage me leverage my knowledge, leverage my measurements, leverage my models. So this architecture is, is really important. It's an essential building block. So next year or the year after, uh, whenever I come back, I want to have 100% of you say, yes, I, of course I get it. That's like air or water. It's essential to what the next generation of GIS is providing us. What makes it so compelling is not one thing. It's a bunch of little things. First, it's easy and accessible, but it has these little components, things like web maps as a service and web apps that allow me to make my any geographic data come alive and online content and smart and hubs and location analytics and solution apps. It's a whole network of things that are fueled by the good work that you guys are doing, creating, maintaining, and making available these data sets. So in some ways, this is an old approach, maps and GIS on the web, but in other ways, it's a brand new approach. And let me share further. Web maps, a central ingredient, for abstracting data from different distributed machines, allow us to engage and interconnect everybody. Just like a consumer map, like a Google map, can be viewed easily on any device, web maps can be viewed on any device. And they're simple. I can pan and zoom, and, but they're richer. And these data sets can be static, but they can also be real time. So there's some discussion here in this community about um, next generation, the fourth industrial age. It really means IoT, intelligence, and I think GIS coming together through real-time maps. And these maps can be looked in apps, apps that are on any device, anywhere, anytime. Dashboard apps, field apps, consumer apps, real-time apps, story map apps, and there are just dozens of them. These apps are taking GIS to the edge, to the edge of applications inside of your organization and between and among organizations. 
these maps and the tools are helping us develop location intelligence. Location intelligence is a state of being. It's not a new thing to buy. It's what many of you create now. But location intelligence with new tools like insights, spatial BI tools that allow us to drag and drop data and visualize it simply, are taking GIS to the edge, opening up the powerful analytic tools that many of you do to everyone in a browser environment. And at the same time, <laughs> we're learning how to read in massive real-time data from remote sensing and mixing that with the power of GIS and AI are allowing us to build a whole new generation of models that predict. Predict reliable spatial information like the map in the upper left is the water flow forecasted 15 days in advance in streams in the United States. Well, that means that I can, how did this map happen? It took the rainfall forecasts 15 days in advance, layered it on top of the hydrology stream network, flowed the water through the network and showed where the floods are gonna be in 15 days out. You understand what this is doing? This is a very sophisticated model. And it's an example of, it's not the thing, but it's an example of the kind of models that are being reached. Well, let me move on. This same WebGIS pattern is driving a word called digital transformation. It's helping organizations re-envision everything that they do, their workflows. Now, we have, most of us have experienced some form of digital automation. That's kind of like stage one. We automated a particular piece of work, making maps, doing a product, whatever. These digital workflows are now being connected through the web as services so that different departments' content can be interconnected and fused dynamically. Sort of a real-time GIS that integrates our collective work in real time. So I can tell some of you are sort of not paying attention or saying, okay, that's kind of an abstraction idea. I want you to pay attention because this interconnection of digital work and then integration of it in real time means that all measurement, all science, all work can begin to be integrated holistically. That's for people from a geography background. That's a big thing. And this isn't some abstract thing. This is all about your organization. How can we wire up an architect in such a way, your organization, so the whole organization starts to operate at the speed of light and starts to collaborate at the speed of light? This is a big idea. And it's just beginning. So ladies and gentlemen, as you build these components and you serverize them, we're moving to a massive change in the way government and the private sector and even universities operate. Interconnected information, leveraging the location dimension, your field, to make organizations integrate and therefore act in more responsible ways. And if we spread this out beyond Singapore, it's just beginning. We're living in an era where changes are occurring everywhere. Automated cars, cloud computing, pervasive mapping, AI, mm, autonomous vehicles as it's called. And you'll notice in the white text here, a lot of these little things are geospatial. Satellite imagery coming in in real time, GPS, location intelligence, geo-accounting. This change and the fusion of this change is just beginning. And GIS, this new web GIS pattern, is the thing that's bringing it together. It's gonna bring it together over the next five and 10 years as a 
as a way to integrate everything. So this should excite you. I hope this excites you. It excites me because I can start to see that things are not going to just keep going in the wrong direction. We can actually begin to have a platform for collaboration and creating a better future. And I'll return to this question, what can we do as individuals? How do we take the next step? And my sense is we need to embrace all these technical changes, not sort of look at it, not be sidelined players. Those in the geospatial GIS community need to leverage what we have and offer what we have and play big in envisioning a brighter and a better future. Put the foot down on the gas pedal, in other words, and embrace it and learn continuously and share and begin to operate as a collective group to create a better future. Now, you might ask the question, is this real? Or is this just some baloney that Jack is talking about? <laughs> is this a vision? Or is this going to actually happen? That's a fair question, wouldn't you say? It's a fair question. Is it real or is it just some vision? Well, I've done a lot of thinking about this and it's my sense at this point in my life, it's my sense and also my experience that this is not only um, possible, but it's also inevitable. Now let me change the subject for a moment. Esri, our work, my colleagues and myself, think of our efforts as building technology and supporting our users, you, in doing your work. And in the process of doing that, building technology that takes on the responsibility of addressing these other, these other greater challenges that are facing all of us. And we do that in the form of technology and specifically in the form of ArcGIS. And I hope if I asked you to raise your hands, you'd all know what ArcGIS is. It is a comprehensive platform that is now completely services-based. It'll still work in a client-server environment, but it's it's now services-based and open and interoperable. And that platform is actually three systems in one system. It's a system of record keeping, like a database was, cadastral records, pipe records, electrical records. It's also a system of analytics, providing people with insights and forecasts. And finally, it's a system of engagement through maps. I can connect people, story maps, interactive maps. One system, three different subsystems that leverage the power of geography to bring those parts of an organization together. Very powerful. So you in this room are unique in the IT space in the sense that you bring things in your organization together in meaningful ways. ArcGIS integrates all types of data, imagery data, LIDAR data, map data, 3D data, real-time data. It brings it all together in that setting. And also it organizes and manages distributed content through something called Portal. Portal organizes data and services references them in a catalog. It references information products in a catalog and apps. So I can search the portal and find each other's work. It also organizes people. I'm Jack. I have certain privileges to get at certain data. So it, this portal idea is again really central to the future of a web GIS. It's like the organizing principle in a services environment. So I'm going to actually ask our friends from the National Park Board to actually get up and show a few minutes of what it's like to actually implement and use in a very exciting setting 
a WebGIS, specifically uh, the whole biophilia, biomania. I'm a biophiliac here in the city of Singapore, city in a garden. So Ken, are you going to come up and share this? Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ken. Thanks. Um, first, I, I, I like to um, thank Jack for giving that wonderful introduction that really sets the tone and the context uh, to my presentation and sharing. And definitely a big thank you to um, Leslie and Thomas for inviting uh, me and therefore the National Parks Board to share what we've been doing. Um, and I thought before we start, um, I, I should give you the context as to what we do, uh, although most of you probably might already know, but uh, I'm not sure if you know how we begin and how actually green Singapore is. So I thought I set that context first before we talk about GIS and digitalization. So th this is really my first slide, and, and this slide actually shows what Singapore looks like uh, in uh, the 1900s. Uh, and as you can see, there are hardly any trees, and this is actually down at Shenton Way where uh, Raffles Place is. Um, and of course, we, we all know that in 1965, we've started the uh, greening campaign of Singapore, and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was very much behind it. Uh, and this is actually the tree he's planted. It's a beautiful tree. It's, uh, I, I like to call this the uh, owl cherry blossom. It's actually a tractoxylum formosum. Um, and when it, it gets into a bit of a drought, it uh, comes, it drops all its leaves, and out comes all that flowers. And that's really the beginning, the beginning for us. And in the last more than 50 years, of course, we've, we've been um, you know, greening Singapore. And a lot of it is through innovation. It's through how we try and adapt and how we keep going and persisting. And there's a lot of determination that's gone into it. So innovation is really very much part of our DNA, if you like to say. And, 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 and this is what we've been doing and we continue to do. So over, over more than 50 years now, I think uh, we're blessed with the fact that we still have um, our nature reserves, which is really the core of what we call city in the garden. Um, and you can see here, that's an aerial picture of the nature reserves. It's wonderful. It looks like almost like a broccoli, and that's how you know it's a Ditorokap uh, forest. It's very unique uh, and dominant to us. So more than about 3,000 over hectares. Um, and linked to that, of course, is an urban matrix, uh, urban landscape matrix that we have green up. Uh, today, the National Parks Board actually manages 6 million trees, of which, uh, of which 2 million of the trees actually occurs uh, in urban areas. Um, and, you know, we are obsessed with greening, and uh, everywhere and wherever we have a chance, we'll put a tree on. And that's what we do. And, um, and the idea really is, as what our vision is, it's really when you're in Singapore, wherever you are, you feel like you're in a garden, uh, even if you're on an MRT train. Um, and of course, all, all the, 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 the streets and the roads where we have got trees and the trees grow and a lot of it are generally quite mature now. And in that matrix of green streetscape, verdant streetscapes are parks. We manage about 350 gardens and parks. That's the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Um, and there's a wide range. You have the Fort Canning Park, which is, uh, if you've not been there, uh, it's rich in history, uh, and it's one of our key heritage pieces. Um, of course, regional parks uh, in the neighborhood, and uh, this one's Amokyo Bishan. Next. And we've started to link all our parks together, so today we have more than 300 kilometers of park connectors, and, and some of that park connectors, next, has uh, enlarged into a network of uh, what I call ecological green. So a lot of our streetscapes are now intensified in greenery uh, into what we call nature ways. And the idea is really to now put in place a forest structure within the city to replicate what we have in a rainforest. And that does, does not stay just at the street level. It's actually going into the buildings. And I think Singapore is today one of the um, top cities in the world with the largest, num largest area of sky rise greenery. Uh, as well as vertical green. And 
And we've moved from greenery into trying to nurture communities. And for us, what's very important is programming and activities and um, education. And that active programming actually translates eventually down to um, communities, ownership and stewardship. And that's what we do in a very nutshell. Next. So this is, this is a Singapore I know. And this is what City in the Garden is to a lot of us. And you see how urban infrastructure is nested within a forest structure, a forest landscape, an urban forest landscape. Then the question for us is, how do we bring this forward? And to bring this forward, it's what we call biophilic, uh, sitting in the garden. And what that really means is now we focus on restoring nature back into the urban ecosystem. That's one. And secondly, how do, then, how do we then nurture, continue to nurture our communities within it? Um, and for us, when we started to look at how we would do this, we also realized that as we transit and as we look into the development of urban ecosystems, we've now got to develop an ecosystem of data, an ecosystem of data that we can share, interconnect, uh, and essentially analyze so that we could better enhance the effectiveness of our planning and our operations. So what you see on this next slide is a digitalization uh, work stream that we've undertaken over the last five, six years. We've uh, gone and literally went through everything we do and uh, digitalized from green, greenery management right through to corporate and industry development. Uh, next. And supporting that is a, a framework, um, a framework where we believe that everything starts from a map and that's a very powerful thing for us because um, for us um, in an organization like ours, uh, we just needed one simple goal and that one simple goal was we put everything down on a map. And once you start putting everything down on a map, uh, you are able to then actually start to share and interconnect and try to pull that data together. And we realized that we've got a lot of data, a lot of very good data that we could do. Um, so this slide essentially shows that framework and right down at the bottom, of course, it's a, it's a map-based uh, platform, uh, a GIS system that actually, um, where we build everything on. Next. And so in, in the last five years, we've uh, moved and we've built what we call Maven. And Maven is our, our common GIS platform. And uh, from Maven, there are several other platforms which actually are then also link back to Maven. Um, and it's a platform that we've, we've used to actually capture the whole range of our planning and operational needs right through from the, from, from there, next slide. So these are all the different layers. So right through from having vegetation maps. For a long time, we had vegetation maps, but they were not digitalized. And we've got them now on uh, Maven through the years. Uh, go back first. And all that layers then start to build up from biodiversity to tree inspection, risk management feedback, and there are a whole suite of other layers that I've not put on the slide there, but it's, uh, it's gradually been built up. Now, I just want to give you a bit of a snapshot of what Maven looks like. Uh, next slide. So, so the first, the, the slide you see here is a zoom in of uh, Maven of where our, uh, uh, of our vegetation map. So, Assuming here today you've, you've got some time and you want to know over the weekend, right, where, where, where's the, the nearest natural forest that you can find in this part of Singapore, you go onto this vegetation map and you see there that's in red, that's Pulau Ubin, an offshore island, and that's our largest patch of uh, mangroves, actually. Uh, for those who don't know what mangroves look like, next. There. All right, that's how mangroves look like. All right, there are nice boardwalks around there. So, uh, so, so that's... One thing that Maven does now, we've got, we've mapped the whole of Singapore right down to um, knowing what vegetation is actually on every one by one uh, square kilometer of, of Singapore. Next. Uh, and of course, we are big into trees and we've geotech all our urban trees. Um, so we've got um, every tree has an ID uh, that's linked to location. Uh, and that is all in Maven and packed to the drill location of or drill tech of the trees, uh, its inspection records, its health records, and who actually maintains it. Next. 
So if you look at uh, where we are now, um, this is uh, the expo. Uh, on that road along the expo, if you're interested to know what that tree is on that main road, uh, you could go into Maven, or for you, my, my officers will go to Maven, I'll go Maven, but you can actually go onto trees.sg, which I'll talk a little bit better uh, later, and you can actually tell what tree it is, right? And so, so for us, every tree is Jotag, and when you click onto the uh, on Maven, when you click onto the data of the tree, uh, you actually see the, the physical data of the tree, what tree it is, uh, and you've got its uh, inspection. So for this particular tree along the road here, it was last inspected in, on 19 January this year. All right. um, and actually, if you go deeper into it, you can then have the full suite record of that tree. Next. Uh, and and for, for management, actually, this is also very good because um, if I want to know who's maintaining the tree, I, I, I go into another uh, selection and layer and I know exactly which officer is actually maintaining the tree. So when people write an email to me and say, you know, I've got a problem with the tree along this road and it has not been inspected, I could reply back in a minute and usually they're quite impressed. And say, How is it I'm able to do that? And yeah, so, so this sits now on my iPad, and it also sits on my desktop, and um, I've got access to it real time. Next. Now, we've, so, so we've built layers, right? So we've built layers, trees, and we've got parks, and if you want to know what's the largest park around here in Singapore, in the northeastern side, that's Pasir Ris Park here, uh, you get it out of the park layer. Uh, and again, you've got information as to who's maintaining and some of the uh, statistics of the park. Next. Now, and assuming if you have a bit more time this weekend, other than going to Pulau Bin, you, and when you're at Pulau Bin, you might, you might come across this wonderful bird. It's called the Oranta Pipe Hornbill. It went extinct uh, in Singapore in the early 1900s, but we were fortunate because in 94, we had a pair that came back to Pulau Bin. Next. And then we had a wonderful uh, species recovery plan uh, using artificial nest boxes. And today, uh, the you, you get, if you go to Pasir Ris Park, you get a full tree of hornbills like this. Um, and as part of our biodiversity uh, conservation, we've uh, actually mapped sightings and we've got good data distribution of uh, the biodiversity. Um, so, so for the hornbills, for example, you could go into Maven, pull out the biodiversity layer, and in the northeastern sector, you can see that actually uh, a lot of that sightings are up in Pulau Bin where it first occurred, but they have now moved to the mainland, and this is quite a stronghold. Uh, likewise, up here, this is actually at around Changi Village, and that, those are two very good strongholds of um, the Oriental Python Bills. Thanks. So, so for us, everything starts with a map, but for us, it also means that having done that or having started to go on, on, that, on, on that journey, it's really about going beyond just maps. It's about, it's about combining operation technology and actually combining and coupling it with our GIS uh, database platforms and layers and pulling it together. Um, and so I'm just going to share two examples of, of, of how we do this. Uh, one, of course, in the, is in the area of tree management. And what you see here is just, it's, it's just a cycle of tree activities that we do in tree management. Um, very importantly, it was it's tree inspection, that's the first thing. We inspect all our trees uh, in Singapore. Um, and with the inspection, uh, the second thing it's about, can you go back one slide? Uh, the, the second thing other than inspection is about tree analytics, about trying to understand tree behavior and structural behavior of trees. Uh, and finally, it's about maintenance and looping it back then to inspection again. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of the kind of applications we, we, we've put together and we've been rolling out uh, just, just in this area. Next. So as I mentioned before, the first thing was Joe tagging our trees and it's a, it's a tree registry if you like. We've got an inventory. Um, our staff that actually manages our trees or have it on their iPads and they go out uh, and they do the in tree inspections. Next. Right, so, so everybody you know, in the past, when we would inspect a tree, we would, we would record down the, uh, the, on an inspection checklist of, of the health of the tree uh, and what we would do. And now everything is it's keyed into uh, the GIS platform uh, on an iPad uh, on in the field, 
right? So that data could then be easily extracted and easily analyzed later. Next. And coupled with that, of course, we've advanced the way we've inspect our trees with technology. We've uh, invested in um, equipment that allows us to tell if trees have got decay, for example. So you've got resistographs, uh, tomographs, and, and where we cannot reach um, some of our trees, we've gone into uh, the development of mini drones. And uh, with that, I was just telling our team that actually with the drones now and the ability of mounting uh, LiDAR cameras on it and using the, um, uh, the drone mapper on uh, S3, you could then even potentially, uh, having captured the image of the hollow, you could then convert it into a 3D image and that allows for measurements of what that hollow is. Next. And, and the analytics that we've been doing is, is in developing structural behavior of trees called finite element models, and this is an example of that. Next. Uh, we've completed that now, so we now have a model that enables us for any tree, uh, having taken some physical uh, um, measurements of the tree, actually put it on the model, and, and the model is able to tell us the kind of uh, wind loads that the tree is able to withstand, uh, beyond which it will fail. Uh, so the failure point uh, becomes very important now. So now we are able to predict for every tree now that failure point. We have, we have models to, to actually do that. Next. Uh, and coupled with that is what we call a tilt sensor. We call this an eye on a tree. You put a tilt sensor on some of our old trees and the tree starts to shift. Uh, that tilt actually can then be modded and sent back to the structural uh, model that I just showed and it tells you whether the tree it's in, has a potential point of failure as well. And that allows us rapid uh, assessment of those trees and we could then uh, take better control of that. Next. Now, so all that model is done now, the, the, the thing we want to do now is to uh, create 3D models of our trees and I'll, I'll just bear with me a little bit more because then at the end of it, you see how it all comes together. Next. Uh, and so we've been doing this with our partners in SLA and the university and, and uh, this is gonna, I think, hopefully be completed uh, by the end of next year, um, what this essentially involves is a whole process of using LiDAR data, point count data, to um, obtain the, the trees and uh, using an analytics to start to discern the, the crowns of the trees. Next. And then to you, by which time when you remove that noise, you're able to then extract complete information of a tree. Next. And then develop applications to actually measure the tree. And once we are able to pull all that together, put it into a volumetric model, and that then allows every tree in Singapore to be modeled. And what it eventually looks like looks something like this. Next. There. So you see, in time to come, we will all be sitting, and some of us will be sitting in our offices, and we'll be looking at trees, exactly how they look like, taking measurements of them, dictating how they will be uh, pruned or treated, and the models I've shown you earlier could be applied across all trees, creating baseline information and allowing for more strategic planning of how we manage some of our trees. Yeah, so, so all, that, all that is in the realm of tree uh, management, uh, and with that, of course, um, as we start to operationalize and digitalize some of our operations in trees, we're beginning to use GIS a lot as well to track where our maintenance crews are, to also put sensors on it and uh, wrap it all around uh, so that at least we have some management control of um, where our people are. Next. And we've gone into uh, the deployment of more sensors as well in urban forest management. Uh, one example is we've worked with NEA, for example, to give real-time predictive models information of potential fire zones uh, in, uh, on, on almost a daily basis. Uh, and that allows us to better focus our operations and surveillance on uh, where fires could potentially occur. And for us, um, where fires can occur and potentially become difficult for us uh, would be in the nature reserves. Uh, and in the past, we would put a, a person up on a tower and actually survey the forest. Uh, it's very time consuming, very labor intensive. So we've developed 
a sensor now, a camera that's able to actually detect smoke uh, and actually enable us to, uh, and alert us to a fire. Next. So you see this is a, a pilot that we've done and where the smoke has actually occurred, uh, actually the camera is able to actually pick that up and the camera is autonomous. So in other words, you don't need to man, it's an unmanned camera, so you don't need to man that up. Next. Uh, trees.sg, if you have not gone into trees.sg, you can go into trees.sg, it's live on the web, and what this does is that whatever my, our guys see on Maven actually is mirrored now for the public, and you can uh, choose your favorite tree and write the tree a love letter. Next. <laughs> uh, just very quickly, I just got a few more slides on biodiversity. I, I know the time's up, but I thought I, I'd like to just quickly share this because this is one of the key pieces that we've done over the last five years. Uh, for biodiversity, you know, we are in the tropics. So Singapore probably has more biodiversity as a city than most other cities in the world, right? Um, and for us in managing biodiversity or you know, biodiversity con conservation, the first thing is you've got to know what you have. So a lot of uh, effort's been put into developing sensors, mix, uh, sensors to track our birds, to be able to uh, survey them. Um, and one of the things we've been doing is actually tagging some of our uh, migratory birds and we've got satellite trackers on some of our birds and you, you can actually f see real time where the birds gone and some have gone to China and back in six days. It's quite interesting. Thanks. Thanks. Right. So uh, um, with the advent of technology, we've now been deploying video cameras. Uh, on the left, you see the uh, porcupines and that's a lesser mouse deer. Those are things that are those are animals that would be very, very difficult to otherwise uh, survey, uh, let alone actually uh, catch sight of them. Next. Uh, that's a pangolin. Uh, that's actually um, near the eco link. Uh, a civet cat on the right. Next. And we've gone into using uh, night vision equipment. Uh, and this is Terma. The one on the left shows your Sunda Kologo. The one on the right is a Slow Loris. Again, uh, nocturnal animals, very difficult to spot. Uh, but now with the use of uh, thermal goggles, we are able, infrared goggles, sorry, we are able to actually detect uh, the animals. Next. And, and for us, knowing where the animals are, one thing, but but we need to know how they move, and, and, and in a city like this, this becomes very important. So we've been using GIS and uh, list resistance pathway modeling on GIS together with our partners at, in the URA uh, to develop where uh, ecological corridors are and how they actually connect. Next. And likewise, we've deployed what we call agent-based modeling, and agent-based modeling was instrumental in us identifying Sisters Island as our first marine park and from there, we know that uh, the currents are emitting out of Sisters Island, and that's where it's all very red, and actually that's where proper gills would uh, best uh, be dispersed from as a source. Uh, and those red, red uh, color actually uh, reflects where the highest intensity or density of proper gills are. Next. And of course, we are big into citizen science. We've uh, harnessed the help of the community to actually survey, to actually detect uh, animals. So anyone can take a photograph and actually post it onto um, um, uh, our BioAtlas, uh, which is an app. And that, at the back end, goes onto a GIS system. We harness all that information. And that information uh, goes into eventually what we hope to see as a, a, a citizen led Atlas of biodiversity in Singapore. Thanks. And this is really is my last slide, and I just want to say that um, I think the last five years has been an incredible journey for us in trying to first bring together uh, spatial information and data, uh, and couple that with modeling and operational technology, and and that really has, um, in a way, brought forth the science in our work, which is extremely. Uh, important in today's context when you manage uh, cities and urban ecosystems. Uh, and I always like to say that if a gardener can do this, so can you, because you guys are much smarter than us.
extraordinary, wouldn't you say? There's so many things to say about that presentation. I'm a landscape architect by training. Can you tell? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, and this presentation really shared what it's like to be a biophiliac, a kind of person who's totally conscious of the important role that nature plays in our existence. And it's not by chance that this presentation was done here first in Singapore, a city that's advanced in its thinking, realizing that nature is an integral part of what a smart city is really all about. So, Kenneth, I, I, my heart was pounding when you were talking, and I want to say thanks very much for sharing your work. I'm sure it will become an example of what people copy all around the world. I'm going to return now to ArcGIS, the technology that we're working with, and give you a few of the highlights of what my colleagues and I have been working on. Many technologies in many different contexts. We are advancing data management with new industry data models. For example, bathymetry or pipelines or airports. We're improving editing for example, 3D editing. We're extending support for geodatabase into environments, for example, like SAP's HANA database, and also can now support unstructured data. Our work with our colleagues at Autodesk Corporation is all about integrating BIM modeling and GIS. This is bringing the whole world of design and transactional engineering closer to your world of GIS. And this means smart cities can be complemented with design and engineering work being done within Autodesk's engineering tools. Lots of stories here. I wish I could spend an hour on it. But this mere work of integrating the two tools means that workflows done by the engineering world will be able to integrate with people who see the whole geographic information system, smart city worlds. GIS is moving into the field. And as Kenneth showed and highlighted, this is amazing because it's connecting not only field workers collecting their data, but also citizens in their crowdsourcing work. We have made advancements in feature collection with ArcGIS collector and tabular data collection. But later this year, we'll also see a whole new technology of tracking so that individuals can be tracked based on their choice and better managed connecting the field with enterprise information systems. We've also seen, as I mentioned earlier, thousands of users starting to use real-time real-time dashboards to give dynamic visualization of what's going on in the field. This last year, this technology was transformed into web services. And what we're going to see for a couple of minutes is Zara, who's going to show an interesting application for dashboard in a, is it a disaster response, Zara? Yes. Go yeah, for it's it. It's actually going to be about typhoons in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much, Jack. Right. So let's just wait for my dashboard to be up and running. It's great to see all of you guys today. So this is by far the greatest um, number that we have in terms of um, delegates. And it's very nice to hear that there are just people coming from different areas of the world, not just within Singapore, but in Southeast Asia and even in other countries. So for this morning's demonstration on operations dashboard, what I'm going to showcase is um, disaster mitigation and disaster monitoring regarding historical typhoons in Southeast Asia and much recently Eastern Asia as well. So I can um, safely say that the past months, even the past days, have literally been stormy. Maybe not in Singapore, but in our neighboring countries such as the Philippines, Hong Kong, Taiwan, even in Japan, they've been recently battling Typhoon Mangkut. And as we speak at the moment, we've actually been monitoring another specific typhoon which is named 
Typhoon Trami. Right. So it may take some time to get these things up and running because everything is real time and we would like to have up to date data set and up to date dashboards at the moment, right? There must be a bug in the software. I'll go down here and fix it. Probably. Thank you very much for that, Jack. <laughs> no, it's well, not why don't you look at that, Mr. Jack <laughs> okay. the German himself, fixing the OS dashboard for us? Yeah, it didn't work. Uh, so, anyway, she got unplugged in the moment there. So, do you want me to go ahead and come back to you, Zara? I think I have it now. Okay, I must Great. have fixed the bug. Perfect. <laughs> so I hope, I hope that it's worth the wait. As we can see, it's very pretty, but it's far beyond pretty. Um, what I find beautiful about opera operations dashboard is that within a single look, you can provide as much information as you want. And you can target specific attention details into um, different widgets that you would like to add within your platform. Um, I would like to focus on what Jack has mentioned a while ago, specific bullets that makes um, certain improvements or what sets apart operations dashboard apart from other web applications that also cater for real-time analytics and real-time data set. So first is it's web-based, as Jack has mentioned earlier. Um, within any um, particular device that you have, even if it's an iPad or a smartphone, smart device that you have, as long as you are connected to the internet, you can access your operations dashboard with, with ease, okay? Provided that you don't get unplugged, maybe. <laughs> Number two is it's improved performance and we um, add as much widgets as we can. We customize widgets depending on the different APIs that um, the developer community has been working on. And what I would like to drive and showcase within this particular demo is, if you can see, I am centered in Southeast Asia, which I have just mentioned earlier. This is Typhoon Trami, which we are monitoring at the moment as we speak. And as you can see, in terms of the wind speed, let me just have um, certain clicks here. This is actually an embedded application within the operations dashboard powered by Esri, which allows me to um, have a broader, broader audience and provide a better storytelling in terms of what's happening right now within this particular region. So apart from having this beautiful interactive animation of where this particular typhoon is headed to, I can also link in additional disaster information, such as flood sensors. So as you can see here, I have historical information on my different typhoons in Southeast Asia. I also have Typhoon Trami right here, um, projecting its course. And apart from that, you can see brighter points along my map. These are actually live flood sensors that cater to different types of flooding, be it minor, moderate, or major flooding within their specific areas. As you can see, I have also added an additional chart that supports the different types of typhoons, tropical depressions, low pressure areas, basically climatology and meteorological information happening within the region. And if I zoom in and zoom out, once I interactively work along my map, the different widgets that I have on the dashboard are interacting as well. So the data set is being updated at the moment and depending on the screen that I have on my map right here. Now, what I would like to showcase is how easy for me to add additional information within this particular widget. Let me work with one of the newer widgets that we have, which is called Details. And I would like to add additional information regarding the flooding information that I have in Southeast Asia. Let me pull in my live stream flooding gauges as my data set. And as you can see here, I have a very comprehensive report that ties up to these specific flooding sensors. Now, um, I don't need much information, so let me just take out some of the contents. I just want the report added here. Click on Done, and as simple as that, it's added into my dashboard. Let me readjust this, maybe put this somewhere down here so I have a better perspective of things, and voila, there you go. Apart from having shown the different typhoons, historical information, and up-to-date information, I've also linked it with additional disasters and risk mitigations that are happening within this region and which are related into the activities, both climatology and meteorological. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sara. Thanks very much. <laughs> How many of you have given live demos before? <laughs> My heart goes out to you, Zara. Great job of, of ad-libbing. Perfect. <laughs> what we're talking about are improvements 
in the ArcGIS platform. This operations dashboard is a new, a new capability using the web to be able to generate dashboards that go everywhere. Another increasingly interesting capability is smart mapping. This allows us to create automatically, using rules, really beautiful maps on just about any kind of data. Lots of improvements here, including very, very fast display. For some of you, you might understand this WebGL technology. We can display thousands, hundreds of thousands of observations in real time in seconds. This is, a, this is really, really very exciting. We've also made improvements in other aspects of cartography, better symbology, better, better production mapping, integrated ArcGIS with the Adobe Creative Cloud for those of you who are graphic artists, and also new improvements for the Microsoft products. Increasingly, cartography is 3D in nature. Here, new improved tools are to make smart 3D cartography not just visualization flying around like Superman, but being able to thematically represent in 3D things like whole cities in real time. Enriched new 3D symbology. And those of you interested will notice in the lower right-hand corner augmented reality and virtual reality extensions to the basic 3D properties. 3D, as most of you know, is not simply visualization. Visualizations gets everybody's heart beating very quickly. But in some ways, it's, it's sort of like, so what? Um, I don't want to just fly around like Superman. I want to really understand it from an analytic perspective. And so in this data model of ArcGIS are rich tools that allow us to do 3D view sheds, 3D measurements. Most recently, the ability to do stereo displays. For some of you, that'll be extremely important in feature extraction. And this year, we're working heavily on going under, underground using support for voxels and 3D um, fencing. More about that in a few minutes. 3D for ArcGIS isn't just one app. It's apps in the browser. It's apps in a pl as a plugin. It's apps in pro, and it's apps in something called the scene viewer, uh, all of which are running off of the same geodatabases. In the analytics space, a companion to visualization itself, there are over 1,200 tools now for advanced geoprocessing and analytics. This year, we added more space-time space analysis, particularly in the statistical arena, new tools for charting, more powerful raster analytics, and new tools for geoprocessing, which parallelized geoprocessing. So, to stay current with very large data sets, massive engineering has had to happen underneath the covers to be able to say we're dealing with a billion features, not simply a few hundred thousand features, and see it as visualization expressions is important. Now, as part of our work, we've also been working on the whole world of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Anybody working on this here in the room? Anybody interested in this in this room? That's interesting. Inside of ArcGIS Pro, for a number of years, have been advanced machine learning tools. For most of you, you didn't really know that. Tools like predictions, such as classification and regression and interpolation, are just embedded in the actual geoprocessing tool sets, being able to do advanced clustering or object identification. We can do this actually now just with the simple desktop of Pro. That's a major piece of our work and we'll continue it. But in addition, through Python integration, we can also access virtually all of the major platforms in, and also all of the major frameworks in the AI community today. AI is a big subject, and it's happening in almost every IT field. What you see us doing is integrating with those platforms and frameworks so that in my desktop, I can access them in a cloud, do massive processing, and bring it back and make it simple in my own world. 
not just the concept of machine learning and AI, but also implemented in a framework with all the other geoprocessing tools so I can apply it very practically to different kinds of problem sets. So, Abhijit, are you going to show us some examples of this? Yes. Uh, thank you, Jack. This data reflects over 700,000 traffic accidents that happen in Virginia, D.C., and Maryland. So how do you get make sense of this data? Let's try to identify the most traffic uh, intersections, the dangerous traffic intersection. One way to do this is by running a tool called density-based clustering. This tool, this tool helps to identify the most uh, loudest signals from the noisy data by uh, separating our accidents data, turning into meaningful cluster and sparse noise. The two algorithms that I'm going to show you today are dbscan and hdbscan. Let's tune into some of these clusters. With dbscan, we can identify top 100 worst intersections. So these clusters are correspond to the traffic intersections in Baltimore, of which North Avenue seems to be an area of concern. Now let's travel to the Washington, D.C. These are the few traffic uh, uh, clusters that happen in Washington, D.C. Now it makes sense that these clusters are at the intersections. But I not only care about the intersection, I also care about the events happening in the other places. HDB scan can help us with that. Now here is where machine learning becomes very explicit. This algorithm requires little input from the user and is most data driven by the clustering algorithm till the time it learns to define its own cluster. Now we can see Massachusetts Avenue that these clusters are in the within the few city blocks and not in the intersex intersection. Now finding several clusters in a city are expected, but what does it mean to be a cluster in a suburban town? Let's move to the move to the Hagerstown MD. Now it seems reasonable that these clusters are within the downtown area, but I'm interested to take a look about this tile cluster was generated on this side. With HDB scan, these clusters coincide not only in the interstate, but also in the parking lot. Now if I want to identify the clusters of accidents happening only in the parking lot, I can use another machine learning method called image classification by means of vector machine or random tree classification. Utilizing Chesapeake Conservancy's image classification, we can separate the clusters happening at the parking lot. And this is why we can identify the top 25 O's parking lots. So this is just a few, some of the machine learning tools within ArcGIS. Now back to Jack. Yeah, thank you. Just everybody get this? This is. What Abhijit is trying to do is predict so that he can better understand so that corrective measures might be able to be taken on certain intersections or particular intersections within parking lots. This is relevant, of course, to traffic, but it's relevant to almost everything else that we do. So keep it in mind that while you may not be very interested in it yet, AI and machine learning are in your future. If you're doing advanced analytics, this will enrich your ability to tell stories. We continue working in the field of image processing. This is being able to read in sensors from satellites or drones or aircraft, be able to do, being able to do dynamic analytics of those and visualizations of those, and many, many, many new tools. As the orange boxes illustrate, we have extended the ArcGIS Enterprise server with advanced image tools and also extended the desktop with the same kind of tools that are common within advanced image processing workstations. This means that as part of the GIS infrastructure, we can do amazing things. Also, some of you are interested in real time. The real time capabilities of ArcGIS are supported in something called the GeoEvents server. This allows us to deal with not only thousands of events per second, 
on a map, but in this last year or so, we've enormously increased the ability to support not 5,000, not 10,000, but up to 50,000 observations a second with streaming information. And in the next year, you'll see that go up to almost a million observations a second. Why is this interesting? Because in a smart city context, we need to observe everything going on. That's the world that we're moving into, is being able to measure and analyze as well as visualize virtually everything that moves and changes. At the other end of the scale, at the other end of the scale from very advanced analytics and very advanced real-time operations work is a new tool called Insights. Insights is a spatial BI tool that allows us to drag and drop very simply information and see it with different charts and graphs. Now, I can talk a lot about this particular product, but it's better to actually see it. <laughs> so Abhijit is going to show us that end of the scale. Thank you, Jack. So Insights for ArcGIS allows all members in your organization to use, the, to use the power of geography and relationship to analyze and explore the data sets. Let's take a look at some, how some of the real estate agents have used Insights to answer questions and discover complex relationship in their data. So as a real estate agent, I'm analyzing HDB resale data set downloaded from the open data portal and for one of my customer, I want to find a reasonably cheaper four-bedroom flat in Sengkang neighborhood, maybe five minutes walking distance from any MRT or LRT uh, on that neighborhood. So insights, uh, insights workbook like this one are the documents that store all of your pages and cards, and that's why where you view your tables, your maps, your charts. Here I could understand the location context of the pricing intensity by unit. So my study area is Pungal and Serangoon area. And on the second card, I can see the tables. And on the third, third card, I can see the bubble chart. Looking at this chart, I can clearly say that four bedroom flat is quite popular in that particular reason. I can click on that four bedroom flat to filter it, uh, filter it out on the other cards as well. Let's create a new map and quickly create a heat map to identify how is it distributed. You can zoom in to get better picture, but that's not the point. Actually, I'm looking for a uh, Senkang area only, so what I do, I just go ahead and apply filter on my town so that the data will be reflecting only on the Senkang area and not the whole Pungol and Haugang area as well. My, uh, you would please notice that other cards are also reflecting. Next, to identify the, the pricing characteristics based on the flat type, story range, and the price, I can quickly create a heat chart and identify the how, how expensive your, fla your flats might be. So here I can see the dark, more darker means more expensive, right? And also to understand more about is the, fla is the flat is overpriced or underpriced, I can go ahead and quickly create a scatter plot to identify the distribution in more detail. And I can just cl click on the linear to get a, an R-square understanding of the value as well. So this is also the part of the data analytics. To understand how the pricing trend over time and the how the characteristics is changing over time and how the HDB resale value has been appreciated, I can go ahead and quickly create a time series chart based on the price. And I can mean it quickly. So what I was looking for, I was looking for to find a four BHK, four uh, bedroom flat, reasonably cheaper price, 
So it looks like this box, it will give me more answer about it. So I can click on that box, and you notice that uh, this scatter plot, uh, plot is also filtered out. So I can click quite reasonably here on any particular point, and I can advise my customer that, hey, you can go ahead and look for 311 Anchorville, this particular block, to, to get a four-bedroom cheaper flat. But how do I know the location? So from my organization, I just go ahead and bring my train station data, and I can quickly create a special analytics to find how far will be the five minutes walking distance from that train station. Once I run that tool, I can generate a buffer that will tell me the five minutes walking distance from the MRT and LRT station. So looking at that particular block, it looks like quite reasonable. I can just walk, and it's a really good choice, and customer has accepted it. Once I do this analysis, I can go ahead and share this page in my organization so that other people can see in my organization so that they can go ahead and explore. Or else, I can come back to any point of time here because everything, every step you do in Insights is being documented at the back. So Insights is designed to be used in all of your rich spatial and non-spatial data to help your organization answer questions and make new discoveries. Thank you. Back Thanks, Abhijit. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. <laughs> From my perspective, I see this technology as of having two roles. One is to introduce the concepts of geospatial thinking and analytics to a much broader audience. You can see how it's easy enough for almost anybody to pick it up using drag and drop. But the other one I want you to pay attention to, which is the idea of spatial data exploration. What he was doing is exploring his data, not necessarily with an agenda. So checking this, checking that, making charts, trying to discover something, create a kind of understanding that he did not have before. Now, it's Insight is an application, and it's right out of the box. We can begin to use it right away. But for many of you, you want to build your own application. There are two basic tools for doing it. One is the Web App Builder for HTML5, JavaScript kind of development. And the, the Web App Builder has literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of apps just in the last six months that have been built. The other one is for native devices. And here, App Studio allows us to build an app, again, in minutes to hours without any programming skills and then deploy it. While these app builders are valuable, Esri also supports a whole family of four basic technologies for developers. And they allow us to extend and create whole new unique environments with ArcGIS. The first one is the Python API working on the server. The second one is to extend the desktop pro with a unique SDK, and here's where ArcPy really comes in. The third is the JavaScript API, which is emerging as one of the most interesting of our technologies for app construction. And finally, a component of ArcGIS called Runtime, which can be embedded on devices for wide-scale sc deployment. Now I want to drill into two of these specifically. The first one is the JavaScript API. The JavaScript API is best thought of as a kind of software library that can live inside of a browser. So think about this for a minute. It's a software library of geoprocessing stuff that allows us to do browser-based or client-side mapping and geoprocessing. Look at these examples. In a browser, I can access data and do rendering or do things like 3D analytics or do 3D in any device without a thick client or even a plug-in. The second developer technology that's worth noting is the Python scripting. The Python API introduced last year allows us in the server or inside of ArcGIS Online to both improve analytics but also do scripting of basic work. 
So for example, in the enterprise and online, I can actually build whole integration with things like Python notebooks. So I can do advanced spatial data science from our standard technologies. And opening up with Python, the ArcGIS platform, has meant that I can leverage many other open source technologies like R, for example, or the whole ecosystem of, of open source tools for advanced work. ArcPy inside of the desktop environment also allows us to do similar sorts of scripting and analytics. And for a small part of this room, you'll be very interested to know that ArcGIS is open and interoperable because your jobs are sometimes to integrate with other things. And well, I guess if I asked you, what do you mean by open and interoperable, I'd get probably 50 different definitions. So we define it in three ways. The first one is to support open standards and formats. And we belong to the OGC and other standards organizations around the world to ensure that our product is integrated and compliant with all of the leading standards. Second, we spend a lot of engineering work on directly engineering our product with other leading COTS platforms. For example, the Autodesk technology or Oracle or Hadoop or the SAP HANA. That's COTS to COTS direct integration. And the third definition we have is that our product itself is fundamentally open with open APIs lots of open source code, and also an interesting integratable architecture that can be extended with good engineering. This particularly is the most valuable thing that allows integration of our products with others. And the evidence that these, this three-pronged strategy works is characterized by the thousands and thousands of complex enterprise systems where we're working well. I'll finalize the discussion about technology by describing the basic product components. So we think of ArcGIS as one product. In some ways, it's like, um, where do I have it here? Oh, my iPhone. <laughs> my iPhone is one product. But my iPhone is integrated with the iCloud, with iMusic, with all of Apple's technologies. So. It is, ArcGIS is one integrated by design product shipping and volume, but it has some components. It has Pro, the desktop. It has the enterprise technology. It has a complement of enterprise called online, a massive geo cloud. And finally, it has solutions that live on top of those basic three components. So let me update you on what we've been doing with Pro. Pro is our largest technology investment. It represents nearly a billion dollars of investment over the last five years. Uh, it is a new, it is a, a new services-based desktop. It works in a services environment with clouds and enterprises. We will continue supporting ArcMap for many years. So those of you who are wedded to ArcMap, don't worry. If you're getting insecure, don't worry. But get on to Pro <laughs> because there is so much to leverage there that, um, that we... So what have we been doing there? More 3D, more multi-patch editing, the AI uh, technology that I described. And what's coming is a new generation of parcel data management, 3D interpolation, voxel support for 3D, um, in the water and underground, and some more support for unstructured data. Now, I'm going to have Zara again try once again to see if you can do a demo, Zara. You yes. know, it's up to you. Career I need a defined. redemption this morning, Jack. Oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> it's, it's quite Show. funny that you mentioned, sorry, oh. uh, sorry to cut, it's quite funny that you mentioned that there are still a lot of people very much into ArcMap because yeah. I've encountered several people within the GIS space asking me, what makes Pro so Pro? And I think I have the perfect answer for okay, that. Okay, oh, good. Morning. I'm glad to hear. I'll listen carefully. All right. So, um, apart from saying it, let me show it to you this morning. What I have on screen, as you can see, is SV Singapore 
S3 Singapore's headquarters, Edward Bausted Center, found in Ubi Avenue 4. Now, to answer the question, what makes ArcGIS Pro so pro, is that it marries together your 2D data sets and your 3D data sets within a single platform. So easily, I would say that's the strongest capability of ArcGIS Pro. And speaking of 3D, I would like to showcase the different capabilities, newer capabilities that we have in store for you once you have finally get into the um, habit of using ArcGIS Pro. So let me work with this particular model of Edward Bausted Center right here. Um, as you can see, um, it's very much structural, even architectural in nature. That is because it's actually a Revit file that I have geo-referenced, and I'm just using um, the, the Esri base map, imagery base map that I have um, since I'm signed in in my ArcGIS Online account right here. So Zara, did you, or did you convert the data from Revit into the ArcGIS format? Yes, I did. So if you can see here, I've actually defined its projection and geo-referenced it so that it aligns seamlessly on the map. So you you did a, a conversion of the data? I did a conversion. So um, let me just zoom into a better view so we can see much more of the building and maybe the areas around it. But I would like to just showcase the building this moment because I'm going to do something with it. I was giving her a loaded question. Maybe. She was supposed to say, no, I didn't convert the data. I'm reading the Revit <laughs> data directly. I did, but we do anyway, have to make some adjustments here and there, Jack. You would have to understand that. Okay, so I would. If you have Revit data, folks, that actually has proper georeferencing in it, it has its datum, it has its projections, you can easily drag in it in ArcGIS Pro and it will appear seamlessly, good. right? But good here answer. and there, you don't have the Very perfect... Very good answer. <laughs> yeah. You don't have the perfect... Um, based every time. So that's yeah. why you would have to perform some adjustments here. Geo-referencing of the, of the information. Exactly. I got it. So let's proceed to 3D now. I would like to showcase one of the newer tools within exploratory analysis. So exploratory analysis may be new to everybody since what Jack has mentioned, 3D is very much visual in all platforms. But let's see and work with this particular tool called the slice tool. What I find really interesting with this is you can actually apply it in real life settings. Say, for example, I'm going to look at it in a planner's perspective. Maybe um, develop urban um, sites, redevelopment of infrastructures within Singapore. And before I demolish or before I move into a different office for S3 Singapore, I would like to maybe slice into and get into the architectural details of this particular Revit model without having to turn on and off the different layers that I have, I can make use of this slice exploratory analysis tool. And let's just go ahead and use interactive volume. I will be choosing box. And very easily, I'll just create a box that encompasses most of the building. And by simply clicking it, I can immediately have a seamless view of what's inside. By readjusting this box, I can have a better view, and I can even record this, save it as an animation, and then maybe add it in your story maps for presentation purposes. So as you can see, I can seamlessly run through the box and see each and every particular layer, each and every floor, along with the furniture, architectural designs, plumbing, and piping that I have within this particular area that I am slicing through. And I think that's really cool. What about you guys? Yeah. Great. Now, one more thing that I would like to showcase in terms of 3D is 3D multi-patch editing. So we have been working with different models. I have a Revit model right here. But what if, say, for example, I have a fully um, LOD2 building design textured layer, which is in Ang Mokyo, that has been provided by our friends from SLA. So let me just zoom to this particular layer. So SLA has been gracious enough to share this GIS model to us of some of our level 2 fully textured HDBs within Ang Mokyo. Now what I have done here, again assuming the role of a planner is, I've added this additional block and I would need to apply the exact same textures that were in these existing models that I have at the background so that it would appear seamlessly within this particular space. So what I'm going to do is I am going to edit this multi-patch. I will be modifying this feature. And I will simply go through 
multi-patch texture. So by texturing, you can simply take photos with your iPhones, your Samsung devices, or any smartphone that you have as long as it's high resolution. And you can actually paste that particular photo of the texture that you have on your own GIS models in ArcGIS Pro. So let me first select the multi-patch that I would like to load the texture into. Click on Load Texture. And from here, I'd like to apply this single face. As you can see, I have this small window right here, which allows me to interact with the texture. I can pan around, zoom in and zoom out so that it'll better fit the particular building that I have right here. So I can do a test, perform additional zooming in and zooming out to see if it matches the height of my HDD block. And by simply clicking on Apply, I already have that face within the multi-patch. Good. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Zara. Thank you very much. There's going to be some workshops on Pro. I really want you to uh, take them and get to know it a little bit better. Pro has a number of extensions, just like ArcMap did, in spatial analysis, 3D analytics, and new ones include a full image processing system, which I already referenced. Also, the ability to integrate in unstructured data will be very valuable for some of you. Uh, it's called Locate XT for those of you interested in it. The second major building block is ArcGIS Online. ArcGIS Online is a massive cloud geo information system. It has over five and a half million users who are using this environment every day making billions of maps every day on issues all around the world. Most people use this connected with their enterprise implementation or with their pro work. You can glance through the new things that have been added in the last year and some of the new ones that are coming. Big one here is going to be the ability in the next year to put your imagery into the cloud and serve it back to yourself with full image processing. The third leg on the stool of ArcGIS is the enterprise environment. And the enterprise environment is the server side of the technology. Here you can see some of the new things that have been added recently, including the ability to have level one users supported by uh, free technology. What's coming is more AI integration into this environment. We've certainly improved the ability to install it and deploy it in massive ways in almost every commercial cloud. Agit's going to show us just a little bit of new tool called Sites. You want to describe Sites, Agit? This is a beautiful ArcGIS Enterprise site. I mean, is it beautiful? Yes. Yeah. But it's just a simulation because the real one is kept secure. I'm going to show you a new capability that, that will change the way people experience your GIS, even when you need to keep things secure. Let's take a look at the series group. This portal has many groups, including public health, public safety. As we browse through public safety, and its contents, you can see the data has been shared by other members in your organization, but the overall feeling does not feel so custom. So here, here is where we have changed things. With the new capability that I'm about to show you, you can create a tailored experience of your GIS. We call it ArcGIS Enterprise Site. Each site that you create have its own branding, own design, and own data. So here I have created one site for law enforcement, police department. So for the police department, it is important to know what's happening on the ground and how they're going to deploy their patrol, of patrol officers and where they should be concentrated. By simply embedding this dynamic operations dashboard, and this crime analysis web map, I can, officers can simply assessing the situation by scrolling down the page. Also, police department needs to have some access to the priority data set at their fingertips and to the other uh, 
stakeholders within their uh, department, like joint operations, so that they can perform. Sites are beautiful. It's really fantastic. Uh, but r sites are also really easy to create. What you need to do, you just need to go to the portal, click on the app launcher, and create sites. Site creation has got two main steps. Number, step, number one step is you need to provide some basic information. Here I'm going to create one for the emergency management. And step number two, I need to add the groups that I would like to participate on this site. So here I'm going to add for public safety and response management. Here is the start. It's for the site, everything you can control your design using these building blocks on the layout builder. So here, for the emergency management, the first thing after a one recent uh, disaster happened, like storm, I want, to, I want to analyze the damage assessment, and I want to integrate here. So what is the first thing I'm, I want to do is add a one iframe here and simply embed a web application that shows exactly that. I can change the size here. And quickly embed one web application in my site. So this site is, uh, th this particular web application is telling you that what is the intensity of that event and how many uh, members are affected and if there is a policy, how many, uh, what's the amount of policies need to be insured. Next, I can add one more row to break out this section. And also, if I want to get easy access to my data to other members, I can simply add one gallery in my site and link that gallery to the pages that I create within my portal. I save this one and create the view the site. That's good. So here is your site, and I didn't write a single line of code, and my application is, is ready. Thank you. That's good. Uh, Back to Jack. Um, <coughs> This might have gone over the heads of some of you. Let me try to explain it differently. How many of you have an enterprise server? Uh, about a third of you. If you have an enterprise server, sometimes people around the different organization find it too difficult. So what he's built here is a application called Sites, where you can take your one enterprise server and make it very relevant for the police and then redo it and make another site, which is very relevant for fire, and then redo it and make another experience view and redo it and make it re relevant for planners. So don't miss this technology. It's a way to simplify access to your core data holdings across your organization. It's gonna open up for a whole nother user community, your world. Now behind sites is basically the enterprise technology. And it's a portal, it has the basic GIS server, and then it has these extensions for imagery, for geo-event or real-time, or for geo-analytics. And we have been working on all these components. I'd particularly like you to notice the monitor application, which allows tuning of these architectures for very high performance usage. The other thing I'd like you to notice is that these servers can be multiple, and I can connect them. So ArcGIS enables distributed collaboration between and among a whole bunch of servers. Let's take Singapore, for example. We have this agency and this agency and this agency. They're stood up really important and valuable servers, 2D and 3D. They can be orchestrated by allowing automatic replication of the content and services pointers from one server to another. So let's take, for example, this idea of a, an SDI among different agencies within Singapore. 
I can replicate the catalog or the pointers of items in one server in another's portal. You get how this works? The diagram is meant to really represent the idea that I can create a system of systems which bring together all of Singapore in a services environment. This doesn't mean I'm copying the data into one data bank, the old style. It means I'm copying the pointers to distributed data in various places. This will allow the integration, a kind of SDI integration, sharing of work between and among the different agencies. Very important little detail that's hidden in many ways inside of the basic um, server architecture. Lastly, I'll say that ArcGIS bills includes solutions. What are solutions? Solutions are a library of hundreds and hundreds of open sourced technologies that are configurations of our basic platform. Solutions for land management, for parks and recreation, for forest management, for traffic, emergency management, and so on. These are free and uh, able to be downloaded and configured to your own environment. They will save you a lot of money and a lot of time. Pay attention to this one. I spend millions and millions of dollars every year building these solutions and making it available to making them available to our partners. And these solutions can be configured into complete systems for water or for crime analysis or or you choose how to do it. Okay, I've spent most of my time this morning talking about ArcGIS, but ESRI has launched into a new direction. We are also building geospatial solution products, three of them. One released for the first time last year, two new ones that are just coming out the end of this year and next year. The first one is Hub for community engagement. The second one is Indoors, taking GIS into an indoors information system. And the third is for designed for urban planning and urban redevelopment. The first one, Hub, is now operating in about 20 cities around the world. Started in Los Angeles, but expanding very rapidly. I expect a thousand cities will have Hub by the end of next year. What is Hub? Hub is a technology that allows not only open data, but also open services built around policies that a government might create. It involves a community portal so that citizens can actually get engaged with a city and work it. The second basic technology is called indoors. This is GIS for buildings, and it's going to revolutionize how we manage large multi-story buildings all over the world. It helps us do space planning, asset management, wayfinding through buildings upstairs, downstairs, responds to emergency managements in buildings, emergency response in buildings, and so on. It's a complete indoor GIS. And the third one, one that my colleague Brooks is going to show a little bit of, is a brand new, very bold system for urban planning. And it will allow urban planning agencies to totally transform leveraging GIS data but totally transform how they do project planning, how they evaluate new plans, and how they organize all of their urban indicators which can give guidance to planning. So, Brooks, you want to show them a little bit of a preview? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Jack. And I have to say it's wonderful being in Singapore. It's been a couple of years. Um, but this application is being developed really with community engagement in mind, and that's uh, really at the forefront of planning efforts here at the city. So it's very exciting being here this week. So what we've noticed is that our cities are facing serious challenges, like increasing population growth, and this is forcing massive development. In response, Esri has partnered with the Boston Planning and Development Agency and others to develop a solution called ArcGIS Urban, which is 
orchestrating urban development and planning workflows, providing a common platform for planners, developers, architects, and citizens. So the BPDA, the Boston Planning Development Agency, they're responsible for planning and economic development for the city of Boston. And they do this by tracking key indicators, such as population growth. Population growth is occurring mainly between the historic downtown and Dorchester, at an average of 80 large development projects a year. So growth at this scale requires thoughtful planning. The Dorchester Avenue Planning Initiative, or DOTAV, as they like to call it in Boston, has been launched to proactively reimagine a, a 21st century industrial use corridor that connects these two vital important areas of Boston. So let's dive into DOTAV. And we can use ArcGIS Urban to plan this very special neighborhood of Boston in 3D in a web browser. Zoning determines what you can and cannot build on a piece of property building use, dimensional requirements, and densities. Typically, we find that zoning codes are legal text, paragraphs, uh, and can be very cumbersome to interpret. But with ArcGIS Urban, we can load that zoning code into the application and apply it in scenario planning. The baseline scenario for any plan determines how much land is financially feasible for development today. This suitability score compares land use, vacancy, and year built, and identifies these properties. We can see a likely development pattern if no changes were made to the current zoning code. And using ArcGIS Urban, we can propose new zoning changes and create build-out scenarios for .av. Engaging in the discussion with both citizens and developers, on how much is enough or how much more is needed. So here in this proposed scenario, the development potential changes dramatically with new building heights and new building uses. These are plausible building forms based on the underlying zoning constraints. The dashboard shows a high intensity of residential throughout this plan. So to balance the space use in the plan, let's add a little bit more office. We can edit the zoning on this parcel here to change it from its residential tower to a commercial office tower. Here in the parcel editor, we can configure overrides to the zoning district. These settings help visualize the 3D form of the building that could legally be built. Let's go ahead and lower the maximum building height to 200 feet. We can also specify multi-level setbacks to make sure and preserve our view down Dot Avenue towards our downtown. And finally, we can create a building type by assigning space use, transforming this residential tower into a commercial office tower. There we go. Let's check our results. So we can immediately see how these changes to the underlying zoning code might impact our view through Dot Avenue towards our downtown. In addition to measuring the amount of new building construction, as seen here, we can also estimate growth capacity for key indicators such as total population, the number of households, or jobs. These key indicators are used throughout the urban planning efforts at the city of Boston and go into how to develop these scenarios more effectively. ArcGIS Urban serves as this central overview of all the plans and projects occurring in the city, like the Washington Village projects shown here in green. And it relieves development pressures, which are largely due to a disconnect between a developer's proposed project and what's allowed by the zoning code. The BPDA's development review and urban design teams are really excited about ArcGIS Urban because it can actually facilitate small and large-scale projects from initial review to board approved to permitted. One such project is 115 Winthrop Square directly in the heart of downtown Boston. Visualizing a new building in its surrounding context can actually minimize a lot of the bottlenecks that occur, offering better collaboration between the city and the real estate developer. And project details can also be provided to the public to better engage with citizens and provide a better understanding. Using ArcGIS Urban, 
We can also run each project through a series of evaluations, impact evaluations, like you see here. In this case, the Winthrop Square Tower had to lower its building height because of the amount of shadow that was cast on the Boston Commons here in red. The BPDA has a standard process now to evaluate plans and projects moving forward to see the impacts on all of the projects and plans on key indicators, such as the number of new households that each project is contributing to the city as it starts to grow. Arctis Urban can deliver a growing amount of new urban data and analytics into the hands of the city planners, but also the citizens. This collaborative platform ensures a more economically prosperous, resilient, and vibrant city for generations. Arctis Urban represents a new solution product that's being developed to improve planning and community engagement for your community. By connecting government, the private sector, and citizens, a new generation of focused solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Brooks. I, I, I want to have you pause for a minute and think. This isn't just some three-dimensional virtual city. This is a three-dimensional urban planning system. It isn't a three-dimensional GIS with nice visualization. It's a transactional oriented system which allows all the players in a city to connect and see what's, what's going on. So it's easy. When I first started to see it and my colleagues started to imagine it, I thought, oh, okay, we could just do this in GIS. What, 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 why, 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 Brooks? What's all the excitement? No, it's not. It's a integrated into workflows system that transactionally maintains the ci city. It's also integrating all the analytics. For example, if I put this building here, what's the additional traffic? What's the additional noise? What's the additional view shed as you showed? What's the additional impact? So it's design guided by indicators in the city and then evaluated in a transparent environment so everybody gets it. So these mistakes or discontinuities or upsets in communication don't happen. And so while we've dreamt of such a system with GIS underpinning for years, it's never been really a system. So I wanted you to just, you're some of the first audiences to ever see this thing. It's going to, I think, enter a whole new era of integrated thinking for cities. Thanks, Brooks. Yeah, thanks. Well, yes, thanks again. Yeah. Brooks's team has, I think, 60 or 70 developers. They're in different places around the world. They've been working fer fervently for several years, building this on all the principles of planning. And one of the reasons why he's here is to get enlightened at the kind of context that Singapore needs in making such a system operate. Uh, I, I wanted to say what's next in our system. Uh, this year, we released 1061 and Pro 2.2. Early next year, first quarter, there'll be another generation of tools which keep pushing the envelope. And next year, there'll be more news. I want to encourage you to stay current and keep pushing the envelope because I think not doing that causes us to all fall behind. Look, here was a quote often credited to Charles Darwin. He said, it's not the strongest of the species or even the most intelligent that survive, but it's the ones that are most responsive to change. And this, I think, speaks strongly to GIS professionals. We need to stay current and pushing the envelope of what's possible. We're in an exponential, exponentially changing world now. I won't be here as we see the future realized, but many of you will be here. The kind of footprints that we're laying down in urbanization and land management policies that are being made are, are beginning to threaten our world. No kidding. And we, that's collectively we, here I'm speaking to the GIS community particularly, can help 
the world understand what's going on. This is a big deal for me. And also how to interpret that understanding into action through all the examples of work we showed here. GIS and your profession turn out to be, I think, the best platform to rapidly scale out an aggressive change of the patterns that are occurring. And I think our collective success in applying GIS will, will create and inspire a better future. What's next? A better future for our planet. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you in conclusion to this morning for being here. Uh, thank you for all of the good work that you do. And thank you for the col collaboration on many scales. Thank you. <laughs>